Give it one second. All right. Yep. Says we're up live. That sounds good. So what we'll do is we'll get this kicked off. Uh, and what I was been asked to do was quickly have folks introduce themselves to so just if you would, who you are, you can give your BCCA number if you'd like where you're at. And then that way we can move on and Brian can continue. So we'll start off with Mr. Danny. You, now you're muted. <laughs> I muted myself, whoops. No, Dan Bohr uh, from Michigan, run all the websites. All right, I'm Keith Kirshner. I'm the BCCA president. I'm in DC at the moment, but I have a place in Florida. Uh, Mr. Vance. On mute. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm Vance. Um, BCCA thirty five five three nine, and I'm a junior in high school. All right, Mr. Beer Dave. Beer Dave, convention planner, BCCA board of director, all right. past president, all that stuff from Kentucky. There we go, Mr. Mike Moon. Yep, I'm 27244. I'm from Gulf Breeze, Florida, right outside of Pensacola, Florida, president okay. of the Spearman chapter. The president of the Spearman chapter, very good. So let's go to Mr. Jim Wolf. Hi, Jim Wolf, Eastern Maryland, uh, USBC supplement guy. All right, Mr. Mike Madlin. Hey there, um, I'm out in California. I'm an Azteca, BCCA 13691, started in 75. All right, Mr. Charlie. Charlie Smago, Richmond, Virginia, 20541. Rusty Bunch name is A Mabel Black Label. All right, Mr. Brian up in uh, Michigan. Hi there, Brian Mecklenburg. I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I have no idea what my BCCA number is, <laughs> but um, anyway. Danny needs to give you a card. So, Mr. Gordon Bragg. Denver, Colorado, 28202. All right, Mr. Clayton. Uh, we, lost, we seem to have lost Mr. Clayton. M Mr. John Harrison. Clayton Memory, uh, BCC Board of Directors. All right, Mr. John Harrison. Uh, my name's John Harrison. I'm in Suffolk, Virginia. I'm not a member, but I got an email about this. My, the reason I'm dialing in, my dad was with Falstaff for over 50 years. I worked for Falstaff for a couple of years when I, before I graduated from college. So I have a big interest, have a lot of memorabilia. And uh, like I said, I would like to become a member if it's possible. Super, John. We would love to have you become a member and uh, we'd be more than happy to hear any of your stuff that you'd like to add. Mr. And a member of, you could be a member of the Falstaff chapter too. Yep, there we go. That Mr. would be great. Mr. Phil Olson. Hi, I'm in uh, Nevada, Texas, outside of Dallas. I've uh, been collecting uh, probably since the early 70s. I've been in and out of BCCA. Uh, and I'm about to hit retirement, and I'm going to get back into this full swing here in the next couple of years. That's good to hear. <coughs> Joel, Mr. Joel? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, friends with Brian and Zach and uh, invited me to this. Uh, so, yeah, I just like to drink beer and uh, – and learn all about the history of it. Cool. Mr. Don Gavlin. Hi, Don Gavlin, Belleville, Illinois, uh, home of Falstaff uh, Beer. There we go. Mr. Tim. Tim Boslow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim Boslow, we just moved from uh, New Orleans over to Somerdale, Alabama, uh, 10626. Super. That Seems to be everybody I got, like I said. And oh, then uh, Zach, Zach is right here. Oh, yeah, stick okay. your head in there. Okay. Zach went to 34109, I think, Heartland, Michigan. All right, there we go. So that seems to be everybody that I could at least see in the uh, the, the Hollywood squares there, Brian. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Brian. Like right. I said, Brian would, would is more than willing to take questions while this goes on. So it's all, all your show, Brian. I got All that. Right. Oh. Sounds good, guys. Um, okay, well, I'm Brian Monaco, BCCA 30199. Um, I've, I live in Taylor, Michigan. I live, uh, which is just outside of Detroit. I live right by the Detroit Metro Airport. The, uh, I've, been, I've lived in Michigan now. It'll be 21 years in May. I, uh, before that, I lived in St. Louis. 
Um, so I was all my uh, early uh, collecting uh, influences were the St. Louis crowd. And uh, so, you know, Don Roussan and Kevin Caius and uh, Herb Schwartz and all those people were Al Cal. Those were all the, you know, first guys I started collecting and hanging around with. And I'm still good friends with all those folks. So uh, I developed an interest in full staff when I was 16 way back in 1992, which just seems like yesterday, and I've uh, been collecting ever since. And uh, so I figured I would put this uh, together. There's there's so many different topics about Falstaff that we could discuss. I mean, everything from cans to clocks to signs and ashtrays, it's, just, it, it's immense and in different parts of the company history. But I would thought I would talk about the different breweries um, that Falstaff had over their history. And that can actually help us identify some things because like, for example, um, um, just, just as, um, you know, for example, um, right, like here's two Falstaff cans that, you know, from a fair distance look very similar. I mean, they're almost the same, but you know, they have different plants on them. And you can tell by like this can stops at San Jose you know, and this can stops at Fort Wayne. So uh, by knowing when the different breweries opened and closed, it, it helps you date some, you know, labels and cans. So, and also some Buriana too. So, you know, it, knowing a little bit of history about the breweries is neat. And some of us, uh, like I even collect a little bit of things from some of the predecessor breweries, just, just because, you know. So we'll start with Falstaff plant number one in St. Louis. This is at uh, 3684 Forest Park Boulevard. I mean, Forest Park Avenue. Now it's Forest Park Boulevard. Back then it was Avenue. And this was, so if we were to take a look uh, at the, at the uh, photo here, the buildings that are still standing are this small uh, cafeteria and office. All of this, this is the laboratory and original office. The stock house, the bottling department. I should say, I mean, the bottling department is still there. These garages are still there. And there are Back in here, there is a uh, case warehouse, and that building is still there. The brew, uh, the brew house. This was um, burnt in 1985 and was torn down. But uh, interesting enough, the floor is still there. You can actually walk out on the floor of the brew house. So, so let's take a look. It originally opened in 1910. Originally opened in 1910 as the Forest Park Brewing Company. The Griesedicks, um, Joe Griesedick, Joseph Griesedick, um, bought it in 1917. And him and his son, Elvin, created the Falstaff Brewing Corporation in, I'm sorry, the Falstaff Corporation in 1920. That's when they bought the Falstaff brand name and logo from Lemp. So the Lemp, the Lemp Brewery and the logo and the, even the Falstaff brand name from Lemp, that was an entirely different company. Um, you know, there was, there was no corporate relation there. Um, it became the Falstaff Brewing, Falstaff Corporation in 1920 and the Falstaff Brewing Corporation in 1933, one month before Prohibition ended. So if you see things that are labeled Falstaff Corporation, that is a Prohibition era product. It was the only St. Louis brewery that was served by the railroad. Um, that's my other big hobby. I like railroad stuff. So I find that interesting. The um, That was served by the Wabash Railroad, and it was the same line that uh, served the foundry uh, nearby. The brewery closed in 1958, 
but the laboratory was open until 1964. And there was also some packaging engineering that was going on in there until 1964. So, um, but uh, all the op brewing operations ceased in 58. This hey, brewery, Brian, yes. One of the amazing things that I don't think a lot of people on the call realize is Falstaff never built a brewery. No, they did not. Exactly. There, uh, that that is a, and we'll talk about that a little later about how that was one of the reasons why they uh, started to lose a lot of money in the late '60s. Uh, their competition had built new breweries and was building new breweries, and Falstaff was not. So, so this, uh, so there's a good good portion of this brewery uh, is still standing. Here's some other shots. Of the uh, of the brewery, if we just take a look around from some different eras, um, if you, uh, of course, we've got uh, bottle filler. There's a nice uh, street shot. That shot was uh, in 1938. Some cool cars in there. Being a car guy that I am, the um, there's the lab here in, uh, down low. Here, this is the case checking warehouse. Is the Empty cases would come back on the railroad. Um, empty cases, the bottles were checked in. They would, you know, make sure there wasn't any broken ones and, uh, you know, all the right style and all that. I mean, that, I mean there's a, you know, that's, look at that, that's a three man job right there. That's a, you know, a fairly labor intensive project. I'm sure they unloaded that railroad car in the background by hand, too. And there's a great picture of plant one inside the garage in uh, 1950, about 1953 or 54. This picture was one that actually came out of the Falstaff Museum in St. Louis. It was one of the handful of ones that was left in there by the time I got there on the, on the back of the picture. It has, um, you know, has the, you know, it says Falstaff International Museum of Brewing on that one. So that was uh, actually displayed in the in the brewery museum. So the next plant in St. Louis is Falstaff plant number two. And that's at 3181 Michigan Avenue in St. Louis. It's also Gravoy. Um, this street, this is Michigan right here. And this road is Gravoy. So what's left of this brewery is this building here, this powerhouse, the smokestack's gone, but the brewery was mostly torn down in 1957. So it opened in 1898 as the, uh, oh, whoop, hang on, um, opened in um, 1898 as the Union Brewery, and it became known as the Otto Stiefel Union Brewery in 1906. You might, uh, if you hang around St. Louis, you might have heard of the Stiefel Nicholas Company, uh, Stiefel, uh, the investment firm. That is the same family. During Prohibition, this brewery produced margarine, of course, known as oleo. It became a Fal uh, Falstaff plant in 1933. They leased it from the Stiefel Company. Um, I do not remember the exact date that they had bought it. I think it, they had purchased it from the Stiefel family in like 1940, but it was originally leased. It closed in 1952. Um, it sat vacant for a while. The brew kettles was interesting. The brew kettles were, were pretty new. And they actually removed the brew kettles, took them down to Neuter Corporation, which is a boiler and vessel maker in St. Louis, enlarged them a bit, put them on railroad car, and shipped them to San Jose. So the brew kettles that continued to operate at the San Jose brewery were the two that came out of this plant. This was a bottle and draft only plant. Cans did not come from here. 
And the office building was the site of the company's marketing department until 1957. And also, there at, so there was the office and the garage. So this area up here was the marketing department where a lot of advertising pieces were designed. And then this back here is the garage. And this was the advertising department uh, where the garage where they kept all the, the good stuff. I am actually sitting in a chair right now. My office chair came out of this brewery. And at my parents' house in St. Louis, uh, my dad sits at a big desk that came out of this brewery. So uh, this is a, it doesn't say anything about this chair coming from the brewery, but it did, so. And here's uh, some other shots of the brewery. Here's a cool shot of a great truck that would have been in the 40s. Here's another, um, another view of the plant in the 1930s. This is taken from Gravoy. This um, powerhouse is still standing. It is a cat sanctuary um, in St. Louis, a charity called Clowder House. That is a uh, oh, they, uh, the, the, uh, cat rescue. And uh, here you can take a look at uh, the old school. Uh, this is the bottle, very old school uh, bottle washer, I believe. No, or yeah, I think that was a washer. I forget what the. And then, now this is something I would. I would it, this is just a little piece that I, I ran across years ago, and it talks about this fellow that that worked there back in the fifties that took the took the uh, stone that said Falstaff when they tore the plant down. And I always wondered if that thing is still out there. <laughs> Heath Henry has the uh, one from Omaha that looks like that. So out there, and it says here that this guy was gonna put it in his barbecue, like build a brick barbecue. So I wonder if somewhere, you know, because they don't tell you where the guy lives. So it lived. I was like, so who knows? Maybe there's some house in St. Louis with a big Falstaff thing in the brick barbecue out back. I'd love to find it. We have plant three in Omaha, Nebraska. Not much of this brewery remains. The office building and a few of the newer um, there was a few newer buildings that were built in the uh, 70s that are still there, but most of this, unfortunately, is gone. Plant three in Omaha. Um, it was a. It began as uh, with Fred Krug in 1859. It became a Falstaff Brewery in 1935. It was served by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Quincy Railroad. Had a 660,000 barrel capacity in 1972. It did not start at that high of capacity, but it it was um, it 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 got to that point. Closed in 1985. Although it did it opened and closed and opened and closed a couple of times, but it officially closed in 1985, which made it Falstaff's longest operating brewery. Falstaff operated this brewery for 50 years. No other single Falstaff brewery operated as Falstaff for that long. So that, that's kind of interesting. You know, it's a St. Louis company, and it's so heavily associated with St. Louis, and none of its St. Louis breweries operated as long as the one in Omaha. You can take a look at some of the different pictures here. Down in uh, this corner here, these pictures were taken in 1935. This was taken in 1935, and uh, you can see the pumps and all the hoses right down in here in the uh, fermenting cellar. There's some new scales going in on the in the brew house in 1957. This is the front of the office building in 1959. 
Keith Henry also, I believe, has one of these shields as well. Uh, you take a look at the mill and also some of the uh, finishing tanks, or I'm mean, sorry, fermenters, uh, fermenting tanks. They had uh, a lot of wooden fermenting tanks in Omaha. There's also wooden fermenters in Fort Wayne too, and we'll get into that. Okay, Falstaff uh, plant number four in New Orleans. This uh, New Orleans was an important market for Falstaff. New Orleans was the second largest selling city for Falstaff. The, the St. Louis metro area was number one and New Orleans was a very close second. So New Orleans is uh, you know, heavily associated with Falstaff. Uh, some of this brewery is still there. The uh, much of the original brewery is still there. Some of the uh, ex, you know, older uh, warehouse buildings here in the back are gone. This is gone. This is gone. Unfortunately, the um, office building is gone. But the uh, the best parts of the the brewery of the original brewery are still there. It began as the National Brewery in 1911, and that has no association with the National of Baltimore. Falstaff bought the plant uh, when National was in bankruptcy in 1937, and it was expanded a lot in the 1950s. It was heavily, heavily expanded. It was served by the Illinois Central Railroad was a 1.176 million barrel capacity brewery in 1972. It's noted for its weather ball, which is not in this picture, but we'll see it here in a bit. Um, the weather ball was a, it's still there actually. It's a big ball that's lit up on top of the brewery with a big pole, it's in full staff and the ball would change colors depending on what the weather forecast was gonna be. Well, it closed in 1979. So here's some shots of the New Orleans Brewery. This big one up here was taken in, uh, I believe, yeah, 1955. You can see here's the weather ball. This has actually been restored. And the tower actually got new Falstaff lettering, modern uh, LED lettering. It looks fantastic. And... Uh, now it has the, the modern ball on it. On top of it, uh, up here, there is a rooftop patio. You can see a uh, part of that here. And there was a great bar in hospitality area. Here's a cool truck on the loading dock. Uh, the brew house was expanded greatly in uh, the early 1950s. Uh, here is the expanded brew house in 1951. These were construction photos. We got a lot of construction photos that came out of the breweries. Um, and so this is, uh, and, and they, I have like lots of pictures that were taken during construction, everything from groundbreaking to the finished product. And so there's your finished product. Here's another shot of the water tub and the grant there in, in, the, in New Orleans. All right, plant five in St. Louis. This uh, is at 2000 Madison Street. This is up in North St. Louis. This plant is, uh, parts of this plant still exist. The brick sections all right here still exist. It's an apartment complex. This uh, warehouse here was built in 1940. It was the first continental style industrial building built west of the Mississippi. It was torn down in 1999 and it was uh, architectural buffs uh, were really upset about it. I didn't even know they were gonna tear it down and Sam Markham and I went up there about a week before they tore it down. And uh, we got up into one of the rooms and we found a file cabinet, some file cabinets. I had my big ax and I chopped it open. Uh, you know, to liberate the documents. 
and uh, I left my uh, axe in there. And I was like, ah, I'll go get it next weekend. So the next Saturday, I drove back over there to pick it up, and it was a building was a pile of rubble on the ground. <laughs> so I never got my axe back. <laughs> I actually have a picture of me at the file cabinet that Sam Markham took, and the axe is like right there. And you know, I was like, oh, I lost my axe in there. So it opened in 1892 as the Columbia Brewing Company. It was purchased by Falstaff in uh, 1948. It was expanded heavily in 1940, a lot, lot of expansion there. Um, like I said, the bottle shop was the first continental style commercial building west of the Mississippi. Had a 400,000 barrel capacity in 1960. It closed in 1967. It was uh, when Falstaff expanded their plant 10 and the, this, this plant closed. From some documents that I have from Falstaff taste panels in the 1960s, the most consistent Falstaff product came from this brewery uh, of, of the St. Louis, of the two St. Louis plants that were operating at this time. Th this was, uh, for some reason, they were getting more uh, consistent flavor out of this plant. We take a look at some uh, great photos from the plant here. There's the uh, brew house. And all the brew house and stock house today are an apartment building. They were made into apartments in the late 1980s. Um, there's your uh, wooden fermenters. Here's a great shot of, uh, of the packaging and warehouse. Cool Studebaker right there. Um, right here, there's the warehouse. And, I mean, the uh, end of the packaging line and warehousing area. Uh, this thing here is the hop jack under the brew kettle. This is uh, plant six in uh, San Jose, California. The, uh, this was at 1025 West Julian near the Alameda. You would never know this plant ever stood today. Uh, one of our Falstaff chapter members and BCCA members, um, his father uh, worked at the plant, and that is his dad's truck <laughs> right there. Um, oh, I'm trying to move around my uh, little all you guys here so I can see this dream. This, uh, they started brewing on the site. Um, it's the, as the Fredericksburg Brewery in 1856. It became the Pacific Brewing and Malting Company and Wheelands Brewery post prohibition. Falstaff purchased this plant in the late 1952. I said plant two brew kettles were enlarged and installed here in 1953. <clears throat> It was served by the Western Pacific Railroad at a 576,000 barrel capacity in 1972. And when it closed in 1973, um, uh, <laughs> um, Let's see, as I was saying, it um, closed in, I was just reading something that somebody had posted their question. Uh, closed in 1973, this uh, brewery did a lot of export, not only, um, I should say they did, you know, local area, but there was also a lot of Pacific export stuff. Like uh, when my dad was in Vietnam, um, the uh, Falstaff that they drank in Vietnam came out of the San Jose brewery. Here's some more shots of the San Jose plant. You can see it here in this bottom picture. This is it when it looked like in 1952 when Falstaff bought it. And then after a few years, they, uh, they modernized it. 
I always like this little castle looking thing right here. I always thought that was cool. Some good shots of the plant there, case storage building. This is plant seven in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is it 1025 Grant Avenue? Opened in 1887 is the Berghoff Brewery. Full staff purchased, or I should say leased and later purchased the brewery in 1954. It was expanded a lot in the 1960s and 70s. Um, it was 1.25 million barrel capacity in 1973. It was also the overflow brewery for the other plants. So you would find uh, sometimes product from this brewery going to St. Louis or New Orleans or even San Jose. If, if the market was, you know, if they were selling more than they could, could, could produce out of the other breweries, this, this brewery would, would kind of do a lot of overflow. Falstaff did not have massive market penetration in Fort Wayne, um, which is kind of interesting for their, their brewery being there. But like I said, it was an overflow plant. There was stuff that went all over the place out of here. As an example, when Falstaff uh, plant number five shut down in 1967, the only court returnable line was at plant five. That, that line got shifted to plant seven in Fort Wayne. So if you would have bought Falstaff in a court returnable in St. Louis, you'd have been drinking Fort Wayne beer but pretty much every other package, you would be drinking St. Louis beer. So uh, that's, you know, that's kind of an interesting part about it. It was the last Falstaff brewery to close. It closed January 7th, 1990. Most of the brewery was torn down in 1992 and sent to China where it was, parts of it were turned into a Pabst brewery. Lots of interesting stuff. Um, here's a cool shot that Walt Wimmer or Walt Weimer took in uh, 1983 when, uh, when the brewery was still open. He took a shot up there. Uh, he also took this picture in 1983. This case warehouse was built in 19, or I should say this uh, aging cellar was uh, built in 1973. Here's some construction of the new bottle shop roof in 1966. I always loved this Ford Econoline right here. I thought that was cool. Um, here you can see the, the rail line that goes through um, where a lot of grain was unloaded. Here's the brew house. This was about 1962-63. And here is that case, or not case, the, uh, the new aging tanks. The, uh, these new aging tanks going in in 72, 73. Uh, this is the building that they went into being constructed. Next plant we got here is plant eight, and that's in Galveston, Texas. That's at 33rd and Church Street. This brewery opened in 1895 as the Galveston Brewing Company. Falstaff purchased it in early 1956. It was expanded dramatically in the 1950s and 60s. It was hardly recognizable by the mid 60s from its previous self. It was lots and lots of new here. This is, this is as close to a new facility as Falstaff ever came. There was a lot of new stuff here. It was Falstaff's largest brewery. It's at 1.632 million barrels in 1972. It was served by the Galveston, Houston, and Henderson Railroad. Closed in 1981. Here's some great shots of the brewery. Lots of, I, once again, a lot of great construction shots. 
All right, so here's just the pile drilling for the spent grain. I love the old truck in that. It looks like it's hoods up, so you know some kind of disaster just happened. <laughs> you know, right, overheating. Yeah. And then uh, you know, here's the new uh, firm uh, aging tanks going in. Lots of new bottle shop project. Here's the new filter room going on. These are the bikini packers. So that's a cardboard six pack. So, yeah, okay, somebody mentioned the state of uh, Maine boxcar. Yes, I thought that that was interesting myself. That's one of the reasons I put that picture in there, because um, the Bangor and Aroostak Railroad used the state of Maine, and those were for shipping state of Maine produced products. So somehow or another, um, they got something from the state of Maine in, in that in that boxcar because yeah, Bangor and Aroostek would only ship out stuff that was made in Maine and the cars painted like that. It was probably made out of wood. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought that was kind of interesting. All right, Plant Nine in El Paso, Texas. 3801 Fruit Street. Most of this brewery is still standing. I went past this a couple of years ago on Amtrak's uh, Sunset Limited. Went right past here on the main line and uh, got an excellent shot of the brewery from the back of the train. So that was really cool. It uh, opened in night. Oh, hang on. It opened in 1904 as the El Paso Brewing Company, became the Harry Mitchell Brewery in 1935. Harry Mitchell had operated uh, a brewery and a nightclub in Juarez, Mexico during Prohibition. It was purchased by Falstaff in 1956, served by the Southern Pacific Railroad. It's a very small brewery, 250,000 barrels in 1956. So not, not a big plant. It closed in 1967. Falstaff sold the property in 1968. I have, in January of 68, I have some documents that came out of the Falstaff archives that talk about, they don't mention who it was sold to, but it says that they disposed of the brewery at the end of January in 1968. So here's some cool shots of the brewery. Mills, good nice shot of the mill, brew kettle. That's a hot water tank going. I believe it's come. I think it's coming out. There was a hospitality room in the back, a little Sternworth. That's actually still there. There was an artist's um, part of the building was used by like an art colony, and that section uh, is still there. In fact, you can see uh, there's like a gate with full staff and, and all that going into the little hospitality um rat scholar area is still there there's some uh you know talk some guys talking about the line this is full staff plant number 10 in st louis at 1920 shenandoah avenue this uh a good section of this plant is still there. Um, I got a question here about Galveston being more modern than full. Um, if Galveston was the most modern full staff brewery, why did it close before Fort Wayne? That is a good question. The reason for that by the end of full staff in the eighties, by the Kalamanovitz era, Falstaff's largest market was actually the New York City metro area, not for Falstaff, but for Ballantyne and, and um, Hoffenreffer, malt liquor. And Fort Wayne was cl much closer. There, I have some paperwork that talked about, they were talking about closing Fort Wayne before they closed Omaha, but Fort Wayne 
had a lower shipping cost to New York metro area compared to Omaha in the New York market, the uh, distributors wouldn't didn't want to accept a price increase. So they kept Fort Wayne open. That, that was the major reason why that, that happened. So the brewery here in uh, St. Louis, um, in 1920 Shenandoah, most of this brewery is still standing. I have most of these letters here. These are actually inlaid into this tile. I have most of these in my front yard. By the time I got around to getting them, um, a, a few of the letters for corporation are gone and the B for brewing is missing. But I, I, have, I have a lot of it, it's inlaid out in my flower bed. If you fly over Detroit, if you flew into Detroit right now, well, it's dark, but the, if, depending on what runway you land on, you fly directly over my house. And if you're on the right side of the plane, you can actually see these letters from the air. So that's pretty cool. This was, oh, this brewery, uh, the first brewery uh, brewing on this site uh, dated to 1850. Uh, by a guy named William Stumpf, and there was a lot of various brewing on this site. The brew house and stock house were built by the Consumers Brewery in 1896, and it became the Griesedick Brothers Brewery in 1911. Griesedick Brothers expanded it quite a bit immediately after World War II, adding some new aging cellars, a stock house, expanding the bottle shop, so it, it was expanded quite a bit immediately after World War II. Um, they also, Griesedick Brothers also built the hospitality area, the Falstaff Inn, which became the Falstaff Inn. Across the, uh, across the street, it would be probably where this picture was taken from, actually. It closed in November of 1977. Now, kind of a little known fact about something that was brewed here right toward the end, Old English, malt, Old English 800 malt liquor was brewed here in, uh, from early 1975 uh, until it closed in 1978. And um, it was brewed under license by, um, by these guys and shipped to the New York City market area. I've got uh, quite a bit of literature from Falstaff about that. Old English was a malt liquor that Blitz Weinhardt just uh, developed, and mm -hmm. then they franchised the the rights to it around. Uh, Fort Leibs in uh, in uh, Philadelphia made it, as yeah. did uh, Sterling in Evansville. Yeah, the uh, Fort Leibs did it at the same time Falstaff did. Uh, in my my documentation from Falstaff that talks about it, they talk about. Um, not so much competing with, with them, but making different package size. So Ortolibs made some packages and Falstaff made some other packages. So, uh, so if we take a look at the, uh, the various furry pictures, th this picture here was taken in, yeah. I, I took this in 1998. It doesn't look much different today. I love this picture down here. Um, this was taken in 1970. Just, just this guy right here. This, this just looks like somebody we know. This, uh, this picture just reminds me of Don Roussan right here. I was going to say, it's Don Roussan. <laughs> um, there's a brew, uh, there's a couple of shots there. The brew house, great picture of a truck coming out. Now, this building here, this is the Falstaff Inn. This building housed the International Museum of Brewing, and it also, the, this was a Falstaff little museum. It also housed uh, the hospitality area, and this was, you know, available for rent, uh, you know, for, you know, events. This was also, uh, you know, for tours, tourism, hospitality, what have you. This building is also still standing. That was built by Griesnick Brothers. Uh, 
uh, the plant plant 11 in Chicago, the malting plant. They never made beer here. This was just malt. This is at 103rd in Indianapolis Avenue, uh, right off the Skyway. There is an exit off the Skyway from here. This plant uh, was torn down in uh, 1997. It was originally built as Albert Schwill and Company, opened way back in 1885. At its peak, it had 66 grain silos. Falstaff bought it in 1961. It was served by the New York Central Railroad. Closed in 1975 when Paul Kalamanovitz bought the company and it was sold in 1978 and was torn down in 1997. A lot of people in the Chicago area remember these silos painted like cans. Here's some other shots of it. There was a, a, a friend of mine uh, recently ran across some photo, uh, Todd Hurst. I don't know if any of you guys know him or not. Um, Oh, real quick, I just, I just uh, mentioned, remember I mentioned that back at the San Jose plant, one of our BCCA members' dad worked there, and that was his truck. That's Henry Enos. He lives in Brentwood, California, and uh, his dad worked there. This, uh, a friend of mine, Todd Hurst, recently uh, shot, uh, sent me some pictures um, saying uh, that he found a couple of pictures of this plant that were taken in 1964. They were miscaptioned and said they were uh, taken in New York City, which obviously is not true. And he said, oh, can we get these changed? Well, it just so happens uh, that they came from the UMSL, you know, University of Missouri St. Louis Library Network. And I am friends with the curator there. And he uh, immediately got that changed for me. So you know, you'll find that information is uh, correct now. All right, plant 12, Cranston, Rhode Island. I saw somebody was like, oh, I hope I don't drink too much so I get to talk about this one. All right, Cranston, Rhode Island at Cranston and Garfield Avenue. Uh, there's not much at all of any of this left. Now, this was a 1.83 million barrel brewery capa uh, capacity brewery. Um, I didn't mention, like, yeah, it was bigger than the other Falstaff breweries, but this was not an exclusive Falstaff plant. Uh, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Obviously, it was opened by Aaron, Narragansett in 1890, purchased by Falstaff in 1965. It was the only Falstaff brewery purchased whose brands entered the Falstaff brand portfolio for the long term. Um, Krug in Omaha, they did continue to brew Krug Luxus as a draft only product for at least a year. I have um, written evidence of that. Uh, when they bought the Griesedick Brothers Brewery, they continued to make Griesedick Brothers for two years as a draft product. I have written documentation to that and uh, also told by various employees. But the Narragansett brands, the Hoffenreffer, the Narragansett, the Croft, all those, those brands continued. So that, that was a unique change for Falstaff to continue making those brands. So this, this brewery did not just shift all of its production to just Falstaff beer. Um, a good, a huge portion of its uh, production was were brands that uh, continued. So yes, I mentioned here the, uh, Um, antitrust court case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, United States versus Falstaff Brewing Corp. It was decided in Falstaff's favor in 1973, but it it cost Falstaff a lot. the uh, the whole the the con the problem was that they were saying that false the suit was brought up against Falstaff that they were buying the competition they were buying. And that's how they were expanding, as opposed to Anheuser-Busch, Schlitz, Pabst at the time. They considered that growing more organically, e even though those companies had some sketchy marketing practices that we all know pushed some smaller brewers out. 
but they built new facilities in these markets and grew the facilities and it grew the market as opposed to full staff was just buying breweries and you know shutting taking the products that they normally made and this just getting rid of them all together so so that was uh, something quite different this was served by the new haven railroad it closed in 1983 although a lot of sources say 1981 it closed in 81 and reopened very very briefly in 1983 and it was leased to pearl brewing company so they could break the union and they brewed one one run of draft beer and that was it this plant had the largest number of employees for any Falstaff brewery. There was about 600 brewery employees here. That is double the amount of any other Falstaff owned brewery. It also had the highest operating costs of any Falstaff brewery and had the highest energy costs of any Falstaff brewery. And we can see some different shots here. Interestingly enough, the uh, Paps sold the Narragansett name back in the 90s, late 90s, and or maybe it was early 2000s, maybe. But anyhow, there's uh, uh, you can get Narragansett beer all over the place. I bought it in New York City. I bought it in Toledo, Ohio. I've, Hell, I even bought it in Florida. So it's, uh, you know, I like, uh, it's funny, we can still get Narragansett, but we can't get Falstaff. <laughs> there's plant 13. Oh, yeah, so there's some Narragansett right there. Bottom open, too, I see. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, neighbor. There's plant 13, and that is in San Francisco, California. That is, it was at 10th and Bryant Street, uh, 10th Street and Bryant Avenue, I should say. And that uh, was a Burgermeister plant. Oh, let's see, we got a question here. Oh, okay. Um, oh, wow, look at that. Arrogance label sold to Mark, 30th largest selling US brand. Wow, that's cool. Good to know. This opened uh, as the Bay Brewery in 1898. It was known as the Milwaukee Brewery from 1880 to 1935, became Burgemeister in 35, it was purchased by Schlitz in 1961, and then it was again purchased by Meisterbrow in 69. This brewery had changed hands a lot. Falstaff bought it in 1972 and opened it in 1973. It was served by the Southern Pacific Railroad. It was 100, uh, 1.5 million barrel capacity, but they never even came close to using it at all. Um, not even close. This was an absolute dismal failure for Falstaff. They closed the, uh, you know, a brewery that was one third the size in San Jose, opened this, never even came close to operating at a capacity. So this uh, this was dismal failure. It was transferred to General Brewing Company in early 1975, right before Paul Kalamanovitz purchased all, you know, purchased controlling interest in Falstaff in April of 1975. This was transferred early in the year and uh, was no longer a Falstaff property. Even after Kalamanovitz became uh, the, basically the owner of Falstaff, this plant was no longer in the Falstaff stable of plants after 1975. It closed in 1978. And there's some shots of it here. Here's a shot of it in uh, 1973. These two shots are in 73. Um, these are a shot when it was still the Burgermeister plant. All that remains of this plant today are these three buildings here, which is, I should say really one building, but it's, I believe it's considered three or whatever. 
Uh, this building right here, that's all that remains of the plant. Now, there's some other, other structures that aren't breweries, but they are important to the Falstaff history. One is the corporate headquarters in St. Louis, and that was at 5050 Oakland Avenue. The St. Louis Science Center is at 5050 Oakland Avenue today. In fact, the Science Center is built around part of the building. They've greatly expanded it and stuff, but the, the core of the building was like still in there. This road right here is uh, now Interstate 64. Here's the walkway that went over to Forest Park. That now uh, there is the, um, the walkway across to both sides of the Science Center uh, located at that spot. This was built new by Falstaff in 19, uh, 1957. It closed in 1975 when Falstaff sold out to Paul Kalamanovitz. Actually, it was a hostile takeover. And it was sold to McDonnell Douglas in 1980. Many of the uh, things that you saw out, uh, many unique paintings and advertising pieces that are in Donnery Sands collection came out of the dumpster uh, here uh, when it was uh, being emptied out for McDonnell Douglas to move in there. It opened on uh, the 14th of October in 1957. All of, all of Falstaff St. Louis office personnel were now at this plant, uh, I mean, at this brewery. So now there was still office personnel for administrating breweries, but all the corporate people were here. Because a lot of the corporate people had been in the Continental Building in St. Louis, and others were, you know, the advertising and marketing department, was over there at plant two. So it was designed um, by a company called Design Inc. It's a subsidiary of Bank Building and Equipment Corporation of America. There's 300 employees that worked in this building in 1957. So here is some cool shots of it. This picture here was taken in 1960 by a uh, woman that I used to know. I uh, I dated her daughter back in the 90s, and uh, she was a secretary at Falstaff, and she's the one that took that picture. You can see um, some of the other pictures. Falstaff had a lot of early computer network. Um, like, take a look at this guy showing off a tape drive system, right? That was, I mean, really cutting-edge stuff at the time. And here's some cool mainframe computer stuff and telephone network type things, really uh, unique stuff at the time. Now here you've got uh, three pillars of Falstaff, Joe Griesedick. Now Joseph Griesedick died in 1938, but Elvin lived until 1961. There was Joe Griesedick, Elvin's son. He was president of Falstaff for many years and Harvey Beffa. He was quite the, uh, he was a uh, senior Falstaff executive as well. So oh, that is my presentation and about the various Falstaff breweries. And another one that they did, uh, another brewery that they did uh, own but never brewed in was the former Central Royal Brewery in East St. Louis, Illinois. That was purchased from Columbia Brewing Company when they bought them in 1948, but Falstaff never brewed there, but they did own the brewery and eventually tore it down. So that's kind of a weird one. I, I did not include that because Falstaff never actually used the facility. So, um, so now would be a great time for uh, questions, comments, observations, that kind of stuff. So what do we got?